Well, we'll start with the count of the Omer. Today is the 24th day of the Omer. It's the, which are three weeks and three days of the Omer. So today's message that we're trying to work on is Tiferet of Netzach. Compassion in endurance, which the title is Healthy Endurance, directed to develop good qualities and modifying bad ones, will always be compassionate. The compassion of endurance reflects a most beautiful quality of endurance, which is an enduring commitment to help another grow. That's beautiful. Endurance without compassion is misguided and selfish. Endurance needs to be not just loving to those who deserve love, but also compassionate to the less fortunate. And therefore the questions of the day is, does my determination compromise my compassion for others? Am I able to rise above my ego and empathize with my competitors? Well, that's a tough one. Am I gracious in victory? And the exercise for the day is be patient and listen to someone who usually makes you impatient. That's a good one for the day. All right, good luck everyone trying to follow that one. <laughs> All right, we'll start with the blessing. If you have a cup of coffee, juice, tea, Actually, I'm drinking a tea today. So we will make a blessing. It goes like this. Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam She'akol Nia Bidvaro. Okay, it is great to see everyone. We're in the thick of chapter 30 of Tanya. Um, chapter, chapter 30, in one word, is dealing with humility. And it's critical that we maintain humility. It doesn't mean that you shouldn't be assertive. It doesn't mean you shouldn't be ambitious. But you should still, even with that assertiveness that is healthy, you should still be humble. Um, before Yom Kippur, there's a big synagogue where the rabbi gets up right before Kal Nidre, and he makes a big announcement. He's at the pulpit. And his short charge speech, he says to the community, to the congregation, that I am a nobody and a nothing. Then the cantor gets up and he says, I also, I'm a nobody, I'm a nothing. And then one of the Jews in the front row, he gets up and he says, I'm a nobody and I'm a nothing. So the cantor turns to the rabbi and he's like, who does he think he is that he could be a nobody and a nothing? So it's important to be humble but not to be arrogant in your humility. It's like, wow, look at me, I'm so humble. It's kind of, you have to be careful with that. Um, and, and, who's, and who said the universe was created for me <laughs> right. in the story? <laughs> right, right, that's a good point, good point. Um, and the beauty here is not just be humble. I think one of the main themes of the chapter is don't just be humble in front, uh, front of those who you look at them as greater than you whether it's Bill Gates or Warren Buffett because of their bank accounts or whoever else because of what they invented. That's not who we're talking about. We're talking about the slums, the person who's on the street corners. You should also be humble in front of them because so many times you look at them and you're like, what is their deal that they get stuck in this, uh, in this temptation, that they get um, uh, tripped up in, in, in this pettiness? And they just have a different temptation. Maybe it's the space, the place that they're in. You get to sit at home most of the day. They have to be on the street corners of San Francisco selling hot pretzels. So they have a little bit more of a difficult life, what they see, what they're, um, what they're around. And therefore that causes them to be, have more of a draw towards things. Or it could also be that you're just a little more cool and, um, and, and, um, I don't know what the right word is, but you're not as heated and, and burning passion um, as they are. So it could be that they have this urge and they have to act on it. We don't have a similar uh, temperament. I think that was the word I was looking for. Um, so what you should do is you should judge them like you would judge yourself. Just like for you, you're always very rational on your shortcomings. You always excuse it. You always explain why it had to be this way. You're first to find the right excuse. You should also be helpful 
on finding the excuse for the other person. Not that you have to help them with an excuse, but when you're judging them, you should be able to excuse them. Similar to how you would judge yourself. Instead of being condescending towards another, you should also be, you, you should actually be very um, um, non-judgmental. The story, one of the coolest stories of the Gemara is, I forgot the name of the sages, but there was a, two students of the Talmud that were, were kind of mocking the previous generations. In the previous generations, in the times of the first temple especially, and the truth is also in times of the second temple, but there was times and eras of, of, our, of our Jewish history in Jerusalem and in Israel when so many of the Jews were actually worshiping idols. And not just the, the no goodniks, the, from the top, the kings, were encouraging and kind of forcing everyone to serve idols. So these students that lived hundreds and hundreds of years later, actually a thousand years later, were kind of saying like, what was their, what were they thinking? They had a temple. Why were they running after idols? Like, like, like little, like nobodies. And that night, Menashe, who was the king, the top guy running after idols, came to them in a dream, each of them. And he said, if you would have been in my generation, you would have been lifting your robe, trying to keep up to me in worshiping idols. Meaning there was such a temptation that you just can't understand because in your generation, we don't have this temptation of idol worship. But in that generation, it was so strong. It's like back then they would look at our generation and say, what is their big deal with a little gadget with a phone that's only three and a half inches wide and, 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 and high? Like, why are they so into this? They should be with their spouse and, and spending time with each other. They wouldn't be able to understand our addiction, similar to the way we can't understand theirs. So the, the beauty is not to judge the other, realizing that every person and every generation or every space, every home, every nurturing family is different. Some have more nurture, some are more charitable, but you can't judge another person for not being that charitable. Uh, okay, I think that's the main theme. We're, God willing, going to be finishing chapter 30. We'll see if we could even try to get a taste of chapter 31. Uh, before, before we begin, any questions? Before we crack it open? Okay. Let me pull up the online Kindle edition. Uh, oops, I will have... Uh, Robin, does it make sense? We're on page on, in the book on 344. Yes, 344, the paragraph starting with similarly with perfect. concentration. Perfect. Second awesome. from the bottom. Yeah, perfect. So we're going to just jump up two paragraphs, just starting that section where it says it is the extent of the struggle. And let's see where that is over here. Let me just go back one page over here. Perfect. I uh, will start at the bottom. Two paragraphs of the Kindle will be at the, where did everyone go? Hold on, I can't see every, oh, you, I didn't share the screen yet, right? Oops, my bad, there we go, that's more. Here we go, I hope everyone can see now. Um, okay, awesome. Oh, did it go back? Let me just turn back one page, there we go. We'll be at the bottom two paragraphs of the Kindle edition or in the middle of the page of 344 in the hardcover book. It is the extent of the struggle that determines whether or not you are actively fighting your impulse to evil. So the last message we were learning is how much are we actually fighting during prayer um, to exert ourselves, to, to fight to, uh, with discipline on, uh, on, on combating our evil inclination and making sure that we, we don't let them get the better of us. And any person who has not adopted this approach of fighting this difficult war against the body could not yet be described as fighting the impulse to evil with blazes like a flaming fire. He has not caused his impulse to evil to be subdued and broken through trepidation of God. So our job is to really not allow the, that evil inclination, a burning uh, fire of, of, of temptation to be allowed to, to, to get the better of us. We have to be disciplined. We have to be in control. And we know that we could each control ourselves. So until you have that control, you're not yet um, on top. Just like an addict, an addict, they can't let their guard down and say, you know what, I'm, I'm okay now, I could go back. You're, you always have to be fighting, you always have to be disciplined, you always have to be in control. 
A person might observe all the mitzvahs meticulously and pray in synagogues three times a day, and yet he has not even begun to fight his impulse to evil. The test of this is, is he struggling greatly? I think this is such a beautiful thing. A person could be praying every day, three times a day, counting the Omer, but he's saying the words. He's not in the struggle. He's kind of cruising past it. and That's not a good place to be in. A person needs to struggle. So let's say if Shabbos is easy for you, that's beautiful. And some people in our community, they look at Shabbos like gold. They, they wouldn't trade it in for anything. And that's the way we should look at it. Um, in, um, in, the, in, in the Talmud, it says, God gave us a special treasured gift. It was the Shabbos. It was the, it's the greatest gift. But you have to take it to the next level. You can never be complacent in your um, meticulous mitzvah that you're performing. You have to take it to the next level. You have to enhance it and make sure that you're subduing the evil inclination, that it's not uh, getting um, complacent. Similarly, with concentration during other acts of devotional worship, such as the biblical requirement of grace after meals, which is what we call in Yiddish benching, as well as all the rabbinically required blessings, both over pleasurable experiences and before mitzvahs. And it goes without saying, having authentic intentions when performing the mitzvahs. There must be an ongoing struggle with impulse evil for more intense devotion and less distraction. So it's, it's an amazing thing. I'm just going to pause here for a moment where so many times we get caught up in, in, in the food that we're eating and we almost forget the blessing that we're making. So, and for some of us that we're more accustomed to the blessing, it, it, it becomes very easy. It becomes routine that we don't even think what we're saying anymore. Uh, for some, it's the blessing before, which is easy to say, but um, it's maybe 10 words long. And after you say it for enough weeks, you kind of get the hang of it where you're comfortable with the words and then you don't even remember what you're saying anymore. You don't even remember you're speaking to God. But there's another person who's actually taking the time to say the blessing well because he, he's struggling with the words. That person is actually more intense in their devotion. So they may not know it by heart and they may be saying it in English, but the words are meaningful to them. They're, they, they're acknowledging the God in front of them. And the same is with the grace after meals and the same is with any mitzvah, whether it's a prayer in the morning. Um, he actually says any a mitzvah before, what's the wording he says? Um, before blessings over pleasurable experiences and before mitzvahs. So we actually have a mitzvah to say a blessing. It's rabbinically mandated, not only over the food we eat, but over any pleasurable experience that we have. So if you see a beautiful rainbow, there's a blessing to say, thanking God for the rainbow. If you um, actually, uh, if you smell a beautiful spice, like we do on Saturday night as Shabbat leaves, we make a blessing on the spice. So it's a pleasurable experience. We make a blessing on it. There's a blessing to say over these experiences. Um, there's also another category of blessings, which is to thank God for, for, for something that happens to you. For example, with the accident that happened to my father-in-law um, five weeks ago, no, not even, uh, uh, a month ago, March 26th, so not even a month ago. Um, gosh, it seems like so long ago. So over that accident, there's actually a blessing. He says, thanking God for the miracle that happened he says it by the Torah, but then going back to that scene of the accident, he says another blessing. It's thanking God for making a miracle in this place, to, a miracle for me in this place. And if it's a miracle um, that uh, not you, but your parents or grandparents were saved in a country or in a place where you know of and you know that what happened, you say a blessing. Thank you, God, for making a miracle for my family, for my parents in this place. So there's blessings for everything. But the beauty over here, usually when you say those blessings, you have much more fervor, much more intention. It's much more intense. But when you're saying a regular routine blessing, you kind of lose the concentration. You kind of lose the devotion, the kavana. And what he's saying over here is the struggle, making sure you're saying the words with focus and intention and overcoming that inclination, that saying, you know what, let's just do a quick, there's a game going on or whatever. That's actually a beautiful um um, uh, uh, the struggle is it's what's, what's allowing you to grow. Um, you know, every, every occasion, we say the blessing of Shekhyanu. Shekhyanu means, thank you, God, for letting me be alive, for giving me the health to experience this occasion. We say it by every holiday. We say it by a very special mitzvah, like the first time we light the menorah, not every night, but the first night, we add the blessing of Shekhyanu. It's the excitement of doing the first, the, the mitzvah for the first time in a year, like the shofar, we do a special blessing or every holiday. 
and it's a beautiful blessing. And, and when I say it, I pause and I say it slowly because it's so beautiful. If you think of the words, thank you, God, for giving me the health for and sustaining me to, 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 to experience this occasion. But when you're saying the other blessing on, on, the, on the drink I just made um, at the beginning of class, you don't say it with the same kavana. So he's saying over here that, I, if I'm understanding correctly, the focus, the kavana, the struggle where you're putting yourself more into it, um, that's um, allowing yourself to grow and allowing the inclination to be subdued. And similarly, with commitment to Torah study, you should study much more than you want or desire by nature or by nurture. I like that. Through an intense struggle with your body. Because to study a little bit more than your natural inclination requires you just a minor battle. Let me just read that again. Because to study a little bit more than your natural inclination requires just a minor battle, which can be compared in any way to really fighting your impulse to evil, which blazes like a fire. For if you don't champion over your impulse to evil, subduing it and breaking it before God, you are classified as a complete Russia. So friends, these are some heavy words. He's saying, what's allowing you to grow? The fight is, the struggle is, is what's subduing your inclination. So if a person routinely studies a certain amount, when you're ready for it, take the next level. Study maybe one line more. Spend one more minute in your study than you, than you would normally. That, that extra mile is what's allowing the growth to really happen. So it's some intense words over there. All these thoughts should help you to be humble of spirit before anyone, not to judge another person until you have shared his circumstances. Before you judge, this is a beautiful line. Ask yourself, am I really so holy myself? Have I even begun to, fi to fight my impulse to evil? And just to summarize this last paragraph, when you're looking at someone else, you could be saying, I daven three times a day. They barely daven once a month. I'm doing so much better. The beauty over here is he's saying, it could be that he's the person that you're comparing yourself to is on a much higher level because for him or her to daven that one time a month, it's taking a lot more struggle, a lot more effort. You were grown up, you grew up with this. It's a part of your nurture. It's part of your nature to be more studious, to be more uh, mindful. So you're not struggling in that. The beauty of what he's saying here is don't compare yourself to another because they're doing less because it could be that they're actually on a higher level based on the struggle that they are experiencing and subduing and which, which by nature subdues the evil inclination. Awesome. All right, let's go further. The next section. Section three, the irreligious person. And is there really any difference between turning away from evil and doing good? We know that the mitzvahs are divided into two categories. One is turning away from evil, which means the, the things that God says do not do, you're pushing away from. The other one is enhancing the good, doing the positive things that you're supposed to be doing. Both are required. They are all the mitzvahs of the Holy King, the single and unique one, blessed be he. The religiously irreverent person fails in the area of turning away from evil. He violates the Torah's prohibitions. Whereas the ostensibly religious person, if he fails to seriously fight his impulse to evil during prayer and worship, fails in the area of doing good. And I'm not sure I understood that paragraph. Let me reread that. And if anyone has a way of explaining it. Um, open ears. Does anyone have a way of explaining this paragraph? So if I'm understanding, does anyone have any comments before I continue? In some ways, they're almost the same because not doing good is sort of evil and doing evil is not doing good. And so. So, so why would you consider the religious person who is, let's say, praying three times a day or eating kosher and doing the things he's supposed to be doing, 
why are we consider him, considering him to be a failure? Why are we considering him to fail? He's not putting much uh, kavana or, or yeah, or, yeah. He's not putting the effort in. That's beautiful. Okay, the intention. So while the person who's not observant, he's failing in turning away from evil, which means he's not doing he he's doing things that he shouldn't be doing. But the person who's religious and he's not doing what he shouldn't be doing. But is he really doing what he's supposed to be doing? Which means he's not struggling and growing in his in his fight to control his impulse. So both are mandated by God. You're struggling in one area and you're not succeeding at it. The person who's who's irreligious is struggling in the other area. It's said, I think this is like the basics of Chabad, of why we're so non-judgmental. Because before looking at someone else, are you really at the place where you're supposed to be? You should be um, he's failing in one area, you're failing in another area. The point is not really to put anyone down. The point is to, to remind you, don't look outside of yourself. Start with you. Before judging someone else for their performance of do, doing things that they're not supposed to be doing, look inside. Are you also, are you really subduing your, your, your inclination? So the area of flaw is different. You're um, struggling in the doing good aspect. He's struggling or she is struggling in the turning away from evil aspect, but they're both equally mandated by God. One is not better than the other. Yeah, thank you, Ken. Uh, and even if from Shira, even if you're davening three times a day, you need to really put yourself into prayer and you need to struggle. Beautiful. Yeah, thank you. So who is worse? We cannot say one is better than the other. Since both are seriously failing, so too with other commandments, there needs to be an active struggle with impulse to evil, especially in financial matters involving money, such as worship through tzedakah, charity, etc. So every mitzvah, he gives the example of tzedakah, but it's it's going a little bit more and, and putting yourself in a place where you're not totally comfortable. So whether it's... Um, could anyone... Sorry, what did you say? Oh, um, so let's say in the mitzvah, did you say something, Cheryl? No, no, I'm sorry. Okay. We were just trying to figure out. Oh, sure, 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 sure. So, so let's say when it comes to tzedakah, a person could be giving, let's say, $10 a month or $100 a month. It's the idea of going a little bit above and beyond, putting yourself in a place where you're not totally comfortable, putting yourself in a place where you start struggling, struggling a little bit. So if a person was keeping Shabbos, let's say, on Friday night, now, maybe it's time to take the next level and put yourself not in a place where you're comfortable with Shabbos, going a little bit above and beyond, in a place where you're, you're fighting, in a place where there's a struggle. Even in the area of turning away from evil, which is avoiding transgression, in which superficially the religious person seems to succeed, any intelligent person can find areas in his life where he does not turn away from evil completely, in everything, through everything and with everything. That's actually an expression from our, our blessing, our, our grace after meals, which we say bakol, mikol, kol. So it's in everything, through everything, and with everything. There's also flaws, not only in your uh, doing good, but also in your turning away from evil. In every instance where an intense struggle is called for, in the measure described above. So if you're looking at the book around 346 now, or even a struggle less than what is described above, such as stopping in the middle of an enjoyable but pointless discussion, or to, to cease telling a negative story about someone, right, gossiping, even if the negative content is slight and minuscule, and even though the negative content is true, and even when the person is not to speak negatively about the other person, but merely to demonstrate your own innocence which is so hard to stop talking at that point when you're enjoying a good discussion, a good schmooze, and you're going to hold yourself back and you say, you know what, it's not, I'm not going to put someone else out and, um, and uh, mock them. So holding back from that, are we all innocent from? Absolutely not. So there is also a place where we have to work on ourselves. So stop judging someone else. You yourself should be working on these levels. As we know from what Rabbi Shimon said to his father, our holy rabbi Yehuda Hanasi, so Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi was the author of the Mishnah. He was known simply as Rebbe. 
to Reb Shimon, who after his father died, became the leader of the Jewish people, Reb Shimon ben Yehuda. What did he say? He wanted to demonstrate his innocence. And he told, Reb Shimon said to his father, I did not write this problematic divorce document. Rather, Yehuda the tailor wrote it. And his father replied, keep away from Lashon Hara slander. Look there in the Talmud, Bava Basar, beginning of chapter 10, page 164b. So the get, which is the divorce document, is a very um, uh, complex uh, bill, a, a document that has to be written. It, it's a lot of complexities and has to be written in a specific fashion. It's written by a scribe, actually, in front of a betin, in front of the court. And either there was something wrong with this bill of divorce. So Rabbi Shimon told his father, it wasn't me that wrote it, it was Rabbi Yehuda. It was someone else. So even that was considered gossip, was considered slander. Lashon Hara. So even on the level of Rabbi Shimon, his father admonished him for, for speaking negatively. So we each have places where we have to work harder on ourselves. So again, chapter 30, it's a pretty intense chapter where we're working so hard on ourselves uh, as, we, as we've done, but we're still in a place of complacency. That's the troubleshooting, what we're dealing with. And when we need it, when we're stuck in that level, we need to be working more on our, uh, like we said in chapter 29, we have to have an intervention. So we're almost blitzing the guy, the person, and, and saying, don't be judging other people, work on yourself. So it's a pretty heavy blitz, a pretty heavy um, uh, um, uh, words that we're directing at him. And it's not often done, but it's important tools to know when it has to be pulled out when you're feeling complacent, you're feeling um, almost in a place of apathy and careless that it has to be brought up. I'm just going to read before we go back inside um, in the Kindle, just a, a practical lesson that's on the sidebar of 346, if you're looking inside your book. And it says like this, the irreligious person is less culpable for his major sins than you are for not fighting your impulse evil properly. So he has his flaws, you have your flaws, but you should be in a place where you're fighting your impulse where you're not. And, he, and the other person could be fighting it more, even though his, his results are less, but the fight, the struggle could be more by him. With this in mind, you should become humble in spirit before everyone. Everyone means Jew and non-Jew alike. Man or woman makes a difference who you are, but you should be humbled in front of the other person that you're meeting on the street or you're, you're, you're watching and observing. I think that's a powerful lesson. Okay, we're on the bottom uh, line of the Kindle. And there are so many common examples of things like this, which you probably do all the time. And especially you should feel humbled about your shortcomings in the area of sanctifying yourself through refraining from, ev from even that which is permissible to you, like we learned above on page 315, which is in fact a biblical requirement based on the verses, you should be holy because I, God, your God, am holy. It's actually this week's Torah portion. A kadoshin. And you should sanctify yourselves and be holy for I am God, your God. So these words, by the way, in this week's Torah portion, it's so powerful because it's saying, when it's saying be holy, it, there's no dis descriptiveness of what he's talking about, be holy. So the sages right away say, be holy even in permissible things. Of course, when it's a mitzvah, you're holy. You're doing the mitzvah. But even when it's not a mitzvah, when you're not in the middle of a blessing or prayer, even then, make it holy. Take your permissibility. Take what's just routine of a piece of steak or whatever else you're enjoying and make that into a holy, a holy moment. That's the mandate, the mitzvah, to be holy, even in permissible things. So the Tanya is saying, for sure, we have to be working on ourselves to be better when it comes to um, uh, permissible things, like regular sleep or regular eat. And you could also find areas of rabbinic law in which you have been lax. And the words of the scribes are even more stringent than the words of the Torah which just to explain what that is, there's certain laws that are mandated in Torah law. And there's certain laws that are mandated by the rabbis. For example, washing our hands before eating bread. It doesn't say that in the Torah anywhere. When we do the blessing on the Tilat Yadayim, that's actually a rabbinical law. 
and there's many of these rabbinical laws that we have to be more scrupulous um, um, than biblical laws. And the reason is because there is more tendency to be lax on something that's not as intense, not as important. So therefore, the sages told us that we should be even more scrupulous when it comes to, to other to laws that are not directly mandated in the Torah. A good example of this, by the way, is the second day of the holiday. The second day of the holiday, we know that they are Seder. We have two days of the Seder. We have two days of Shavuot. We have two days of Simchas Torah, Shemini Atzeres and Simchas Torah. In Israel, they only have one day. And the reason is because in the diaspora, we couldn't get the message quick enough of when was the new moon. So we were still doubtful when is the new moon and when is the 15th of the month? When is uh, the holiday? So therefore in the diaspora, in the times of the temple, they had to keep two days of the holiday because they were unsure which day was the real Seder. So even though nowadays we have a calendar, we still keep a two day holiday. So a lot of people could say it's not that important because it's not the real holiday. So we're actually extra careful on the second day of the holiday as much or perhaps even more than the first day of the holiday. There's certain laws that are stricter on the second day of the holiday than the first day, just to make sure that the person is not going to be lax on those things. So what the Tanya is trying to bring up is there's, there's areas of our life when we are where we are more lax and it's just natural tendency. So before judging another, look in, inside yourself in your, in, in your um, what, what we've been talking about on this page, in your gossip and in your slander and your judgment of other people, look inside first. And look in your performance, not only on the mitzvahs that you, you perhaps take a little bit with less intention, but even on things that are not a mitzvah, the permissible things, that you should be a little bit more careful and mindful of how you, how you behave in them. And then on laws that are of rabbinical ordinance rather than of biblical. Yet all these things and others are like the sins which a person tramples under his feet and fails to take seriously. And these are sins, these sins are now regarded as permissible since they have been violated repeatedly, etc. So when a person does things enough times, it actually doesn't seem so bad. The first time you do it, it's, it's terrible. But after you get you kind of get in a routine, you almost convince yourself it's not that bad anymore. So those are things that a person just tramples over and doesn't really pay much attention to. So what he's saying here is those things you have to be careful with as well. But in truth, if you are learned in Jewish text and you hold fast to God's Torah and you desire to be close to Hashem, then even these minor sins should make you feel that you, your sin is too great to bear, which is actually a verse from um, Adam, from uh, Cain, which is in the first uh, few chapters of the Torah, where Cain says, God, can you not bear my sin? Is there not... Um, but can you not cut me some slack? So just the, the, the beauty of these words is if you take in a relationship, which I, I like to always go back to relationship, a lot of times it's not the, it doesn't matter the intensity of your lie. If you lie to your spouse, it doesn't matter if it was in a big thing or a little thing. The fact is you turn your back against them. You're, it's, it's a disconnection. So it, when it comes to a relationship, it doesn't matter so much what it is that you did. Of course, that matters also. But what he's saying here is the, the importance is the connection, the relationship, the closeness. And when you do something and turn your back, even if it seems like a minor thing, you could tell your spouse, who cares? It's not even important. But for that person, it is important. For you, maybe it's not. So it's not about you. It's about the relationship. So the same is with God. Even if it seems like a, a petty mitzvah that you trample over and, and you don't, give much attention to those mitzvahs also you have to put your 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 dedication and your loyalty in and when you're lacking in that you should know that the person standing on the street could be on a place that's higher than you because he's struggling to fulfill it while you're not struggling in that in that aspect And your culpability is far greater, doubled and redoubled in, in that you fail to battle and overcome your impulse to evil at the level of intense struggle mentioned above. So in this sense, your culpability is more than that of the most religiously irreverent person who sits on at street corners and is far from God in his Torah. Because those, that's a powerful, like just to, if you, if you want to really um, develop a non-judgmental 
method. It's, it's really on these pages. It really brings it home. Because with those distant from God, their culpability is not so great. In their failure, in, in their failure to overcome the, the impulse to evil, which blazes like a flaming fire. As a result of trepidation of God, who watches over and discerns all of their deeds. Their culpability does not approach that of someone who comes near to God. So someone who's closer, let's say the king. If you have a king in a palace, he's expecting more of his ministers that are closest to him. They should know better. Their respect, their diligence, their loyalty. So the same is with a person who is more involved in, in Jewish life and, and more involved in prayer, etc. Their culpability is more than a person who's on the street corners and feeling and more distant. to his Torah and his service, because from the religious person, more is expected. As our rabbi, the blessed memory taught about Acher, one of the greatest Talmudic sages, who later deviated from traditional Judaism, that his culpability was greater because he had known my glory. He had been close to God, and therefore he should have known better. By the way, just a, a, a little bit about this man, his name wasn't really Acher, whoops. Acher means another person. His name was actually Elisha. Next week in chapter 4 of the Mishnah, of Perkei Avot on Tuesday evening that we've been studying, we're going to learn a Mishnah about Elisha ben Avuya. That was his name. Elisha ben Avuya deviated from the path of Torah. He was a giant of Torah. He was the teacher of Rabbi Meir. Rabbi Meir is the main um, opinion of the Mishnah. Whenever there's an opinion in the Mishnah without, the, without a reference to the author, it's Rabbi Meir. Whenever there's no uh, uh, name to an opinion, it's simply Rabbi Meir because he was the, one of the main authorities. He got most of his Torah from a rabbi whose name was Elisha that left the path of Torah. He, he, he in Yiddish, we call it fried out. He, he, he removed himself from the, from the Torah observance path. But he still had an incredible knowledge of Torah. It says once that... Um, Rabbi Meir was studying on Shabbos in the, in the academy, and a student of his said, you should know your teacher is riding uh, on the horse on Shabbos, which is forbidden to do. We don't ride horses on Shabbos. So Rabbi Meir ran out to, to uh, have a discussion with him. As Rabbi, Meir is, as Rabbi Meir is walking along the path, his teacher, who left the path of Torah, was riding the horse, and they were having a Torah discussion on Shabbos. And at a certain point, the teacher, who became known as Acher, Acher means the other. They, they didn't recognize him anymore. They call him the other one. Acher told her, Mayor, you have to stop. You can't go further because as we've been the teaching, as I've been discussing Torah with you, I've been counting our steps. And you reach the step, the limits, the city limits of where you could go. As we know on Shabbos, there's um, a few miles that we could travel outside of a city. Within a city, you could go as far as you want. But outside of the city uh, limits, outskirts of the city, uh, we, don't, we don't go further than a certain amount because then it's considered a journey. And we don't take travels or journeys on Shabbos. So there's a certain tchum, it's called in Hebrew, a certain boundary that we have. So uh, Rabbi Meir is told by his teacher, you have to stop because I've been counting our steps as we've been discussing. And you reach this. The, so go back. Return. So a mayor says, I want you to return also. What he meant is don't return just to the academy, return to the life of Torah. You also, at Chazerbach, re return. And he says, it's too late, I can't. I've heard it said, I heard a, a, an echo of the heavens that says, Acher will never be accepted back. That's what he heard. It's a very heavy statement to hear from the heavens. So he couldn't, he says, I can't. So this Acher, and just by the way, the, the Rebbe has a beautiful teaching that when, it, when he heard the echo that said Acher can't be taken back, Acher became a nickname for him. Acher means the other one because everyone saw him, couldn't believe that such a giant of Torah teaching could have left the path of Torah. So they said, this is someone else, Acher, it's someone else. So the echo he heard was Acher can't be taken back. What the Rebbe understood that to mean is only Acher, the the person who he looked himself, who, who he saw himself as, when he looked in the mirror, he saw someone else. That can't be taken back. We want your true soul. 
the real you, Elisha, the son of Avuya, he can be brought back. Acher, that mirror image of you, that you try to, the, um, the, the complex you put on yourself, that is, is, you have to throw away. What should be returned, what can be returned, is the true you, the true soul, the identity, which is, like we're saying, the godly soul, that's your true identity. Anyway, the reason why I bring up Acher, and the reason why it's brought up over here in the, in the Tanya, is because Acher knew better. The reason why the, the heavenly court was so judgmental against Acher is because he knew better. He knew the law, and he willingly, intentionally decided to break it. Most people now, most Jews, didn't grow up with knowing all the laws. Didn't grow up with a, an experience that was so warm and um, educating. In, in their Torah observance. So really, you can't blame them for, for the little bit that they know. On the contrary, they have to be embraced and applauded for knowing so little and yet working so hard. But the Tanya is saying to, to the person who's judging them, saying you, the person who's religious, the person who's um, uh, praying three times a day, etc., you know better. So therefore, when you gossip, it's a lot worse. You're held to a higher level of culpability than the person who doesn't know better. He doesn't even know it's wrong. He doesn't know it's mandated in the, Torah, in the Torah. You know better. So therefore, you are held to a higher standard, so to speak, than that person. And therefore, you have to be more careful. Any questions on that? Uh, oh, I'm sorry, Adrian. I just see your question now, but let me go back. Does this correspond to positive or negative? It, um, yeah, Adrian, so that's a good point. Um, the two categories of mitzvot, over here it's saying about turning away from evil and, the, and doing good. That does correspond, I think, to the positive mitzvahs of doing the good ones and staying away from the evil ones. I think so. Good point, Adrian. Sorry, I missed that. The example of Lashon Haro is good. You need to stop yourself from participating, even if the thing being said about another seems benign. Um, definitely, Shira, it's so hard to actually do. Sometimes you're in a juicy conversation. To pull yourself away from it is, uh, it actually says in the Talmud, one of the mitzvahs that we don't, we're not, um, saved from every day. I don't remember the third, but the two is um, 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 lack of Torah study, meaning we should be studying more and our, our distraction from Torah study, we're not saved from, meaning every day we are guilty of that, so to speak. Another is the Lashon Hara that we're guilty of every day. Even if it's not in speech, it's in mind, right? You're judging someone else. So it's something we constantly have to be working on ourselves. I don't remember the third, Barbara, it's in the Talmud, so maybe if Howard is nearby, you could uh, uh, you could uh, give a quick call in. But I don't remember the third. But um, yeah, th that was a good example that we have to work on. Um, okay, any questions as we're going through? Okay. Uh, so that's about Acher. Acher, his name was actually Elisha ben Abuya, but the reason why he was held to higher standards is because he knew better. And, and, you know, whether it's, um, you know, when you see an officer, uh, you know, a police officer, when you see them speaking on the phone in the car, you almost feel like, what? You're not wearing a seatbelt? You're speaking on the phone? You're the one that's supposed to be the role models. I'm not, I'm not saying every police is good. And, and obviously there's, there's, uh, there's a lot of work that has to be done there. But even a rabbi, they should be, they, it's, it's their character that people are looking at more than the, their speeches. Because they know better. They, they're held to a higher standard. And that's actually, a, by the way, just I need to say one more thing. One of them, I'll tell you just uh, very personal. Um, I, I went to a few yeshivas over my, I don't know what you call it, over my career, over my yeshiva experience. One of them was in LA, which was a much smaller yeshiva. We we're talking about a, a group of maybe 50, you know, 45. The second year maybe went up to 60. Uh, but it was a smaller group of, of students that we were together. The next year, I went to a massive yeshiva with 350 students where people didn't even know my name. It wasn't as, you know, in my circle, of course, we had our friends and, and we had my teacher, but there were so many teachers and so many students. And between the two, there was, an, there was a beauty and experience to each one that was very positive. To be immersed in, in a massive room full of Torah study, and it was, it was amazing. But at the same time, there was something so special of when you're in a smaller group where you almost feel you have to live up to a certain standard. And not in a way that you're almost putting on a show, but in a way that in Hebrew it's called a dugmachaya, 
I always wanted to be in a place where you you are a role model for other people. And and you know, last night in the in our Pirkei Avot discussion, Tessa and Fred and, and Howard and Barbara, we had a nice discussion about lishma, about doing things for the right reason, for the sake of Torah. You're not doing it because of your own prestige and honor. You're doing it because it's the right thing to do. You're doing it for the Torah's sake. You study for the Torah's sake, not because you want more um, intelligence. But at the same time, you're not always on that level of doing things for the right reason. Sometimes you fake it until you make it. And it's a good thing. It's not a bad thing to fake it. Because eventually it's going to become part of your routine. And that's a very important thing. But then, like we're saying here, you have to work on it. You have to struggle. You have to exert yourself more than what you're accustomed to and grow on it. But the idea of, of being a, in a place of a role model, it would mean that even when you're not feeling it, you still do it because you're a teacher and, or you're a, you're, a, you're a parent, you're a grandparent, you're, you're, uh, you're an, an employee or an employer where your, your work environment is looking up for, at you uh, for, the, for the right ethics. So it's unbecoming of you to do anything less. And that's actually a beautiful place to be in, in whatever environment. Yaakov, in the truck environment, I'm sure you have a lot of friends that respect you for who you are. Um, and that, you know, if they see you doing something that is unbecoming, it's, it's a lot worse than if just the, the average Joe truck, tr truck driver is doing it because you are who you are. You're studying Torah. You're more in, involved in it. Uh, sorry, Yaakov, uh, making you shy. It looks like you're uh, blushing over there. <laughs> <laughs> No, that's that's true. One of the guys here, uh, he goes, oh, you're Jewish? I said, yeah. He says, yeah, I think I am, too. I wear this. And he had the, the Star of David. And so he talks to me all the time about things. And I keep telling him that uh, that being Jewish and he, he says, he says, I don't mind claiming it. I just don't know if I want to practice it. I said, practicing being a, uh, being Jewish is like practicing breathing. You know, it's just, it, it's something so natural, but they're all, they're all like asking me questions and seeing how I'm going to respond to things. So, yeah, I know what that means. And and by the way, like wearing a yarmulke, I know you wear a hat most of the time, but it's also part of the, you're, you're representing not just yourself, you're representing your role model for so many. Um, I was just, it's an interest, like just yesterday, we have a landscaper at, at the building and I've never had a landscaper before, so it's a whole new experience. Like I think I, I mentioned last week, like uh, the PG&E bill, like things are like, there's obviously a lot bigger expenses, but the landscaper is a nice guy. He's hoping that we keep him as his landscaper because he was for the old uh, owner and he's a, he's a good guy. I, I don't see why I shouldn't. So I'm happy with him. So yesterday he came and I had to pay him for the month of, for the month. And um, his wife, I guess, takes care of the building. So I gave him the check. His wife was in the car. And he runs back in. He's like, my wife wants to, my wife wants to meet you. And it's just, I didn't, I didn't recognize who she was, but she was so excited to meet me because um, around eight years ago, probably within the first two years of moving here, there was a, a sweet older man. His name was Neil Brent. He lived in Novato, Jewish guy, but he was very sick and he wasn't able to leave his house. So I would go visit him maybe every three weeks. I would just sit by his bed and we would have a Torah discussion. And he liked attention. He was a nice, sweet man that couldn't leave his house. He had a 24-hour care. Um, so I would knock on the door and someone would answer, the caregiver. I would say hello and be respectful and then go visit Neil. And he passed away like seven and a half or eight years ago. But she, the landscaper's wife, was one of Neil's caregivers. And he had many caregivers. So I wouldn't have recognized her, but she loved the way how, like she was, she was, she wanted to have a few minutes with me because of how I treated her when I would come to the door and be respectful and and uh, I don't I don't even remember exactly what but but you're held to a higher standard um, and it's a good place to be in to be held to a higher standard and each one of us should be should try to find a place where they could be in a position of being a role model um, over here it's saying it more be careful because you're going to be culpable on a higher level but it's actually good to to when you're not feeling it to still act on it and fake it a little bit because. Um, it's the right thing. Okay, I hope um, I didn't bore you guys on that a little too much, but we'll finish the chapter now. Uh, the last line on the Kindle. And that is why our sages of blessed memory taught in reference to those uneducated in Judaism, that since they're unaware of the severity of their actions, their deliberate sins are considered as inadvertent acts. When a person does something without knowing that it's wrong to do, it's actually, it's not, 
it's downgraded as not that bad of something because they didn't know better. But for me and you, people that are studying, people that are learning and know better, and they still choose not to, they're held to a higher standard. So let's just see the practical lessons and, um, and uh, we'll end after that. Always, and we've actually reviewed these during the chapter, but in the Kindle, it comes at the end, and I actually enjoy reading them over again. It's, it's a good way to end the class. Always judge others favorably because you don't know their circumstances and the power of their impulse to evil. So it could be that they have a much more of a passion to do bad based on how they grew up or based on whatever than you have. So don't judge them. Judge them favorably. You're not living up to God's expectations if you're not aggressively fighting your impulse to evil, to have more devotion and less distractions. This is a hard one to do. God has big expectations of you. If you're just being complacent, which means you could be praying three times a day, you could be doing the grace after meals, and you could be doing great things, giving charity. But if it's not up to the ability of God's expectations, you're not actually um, in, in a place of, of um, um, curving the impulse to evil, the fighting. The religious person is less culpable for his major sins than you are for not fighting your impulse uh, to evil properly. Because you, like Acher, you know better. With this in mind, you should become humble in spirit before everyone. I, I, th I think these are beautiful lessons to end the chapter. Um, does anyone have any questions on the chapter? Or comments? I think I have a comment on the, the chapter. Uh,